as we've talked about, the second half of it, I think, starts in chapter 25 where Ezekiel starts pronouncing judgments against all the nations that have plagued Israel and Judah for so long. Um, There's the outline we're using. Um, chapters 25 through 32 are a series of judgments against uh, seven nations. Most of these have long histories with uh, Israel. They had plagued Israel for a long time. Um, and the message is that God will judge these nations once and for all. And also there's a brief paragraph sort of in the middle of that section where he talks about hope for Israel. Because of these judgments, Israel will, Israel's position would be uh, established and God, uh, God and his people would be vindicated. What brings us to a climax is chapter 33, where in chapter 33 you've got um, the messenger who comes and gives uh, the, the report that the city of Jerusalem has fallen. So here's someone who witnessed it fall and then he has taken exile. And uh, the date on this uh, is several months after the fall of Jerusalem. So they get message that uh, the fall has taken place. And, and that, if you recall, as we've talked about in the chronology of the book of, of Ezra, he's um, he uses... A typical formula is the year, the month, and the day. He gets pretty precise. And how he uses his dates, say, in contrast to, let's say, uh, uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah's dates are all over the place. Uh, there's nothing sequential about the dates in Jeremiah. But uh, Ezekiel's, for the most part, with a with couple of exceptions, his dates are sequential. So he starts on this date. And he gets us closer and closer to the fall of Jerusalem. And then finally, chapter 33, the fall of Jerusalem has happened. So it kind of brings to a close everything that he's been talking about uh, up to this point. Then starting in chapter 34, most of this becomes hopeful types of prophecy where uh, we, he's looking to the future of, of Israel. Uh, I think he, most of these most of them, not all of them, I think, are about the Messianic era. When the Messiah would come, he would bring relief. Uh, we uh, looked at this last time. There's basically two parts to the last half of, of uh, to these, uh, this final portion of Ezekiel. There's the proclamation of the good news, and then there's the envisioning of the good news. One of them deals with God's deliverance of Israel in, in several different ways chapters 34 through 39, then chapters 40 through 48, he deals with the return of, of the Lord, and it's largely couched in, in this image of this temple that will get built at some point, and, and it matches up with what we saw at the beginning of the book. In the beginning of the book, where uh, Ezekiel sees the glory of the Lord. He sees the glory of the Lord in Babylon. He sees the glory of the Lord in the plain, and then he's taken in a vision to the temple, and the glory of the Lord departs the temple, it departs the city, and it goes out east of the city. So there's the departure of God's glory, and then in the last half of the book, the Lord returns. And so it's uh, the return of God's glory upon his people. So that's uh, the theme in chapters 40 through 48. This is what we, we looked at chapters 34 through 37 last time. The imagery of God putting new shepherds over his flock. Uh, chapter 34 very plainly deals with the failure of Israel's shepherds, and that is the national leaders, the spiritual leaders, the elders of the nation, the priests, the prophets, the kings, the princes. They have all failed to protect uh, Israel from her enemies, and the result has been catastrophic. So twice in chapter 34, the Lord promises he'll appoint a new shepherd. First of all, the shepherd is God himself, and then secondly, it is a descendant of David who happens to be, of course, the Messiah. I think the first part of the prophecy deals with the return from exile. God himself would take care of that. And then there's a future restoration which would take place with the Messiah, that's the second uh, half of chapter 34. Then there's the restoration of the land. Uh, chapter 35 is a judgment against the Ammonites. 
there's a little bit of a judgment against them earlier in Ezekiel, but the Ammonites in particular, in particular apparently were really, really, really excited about the fall of the nation. So he, he deals with that, and then in chapter 36, uh, he talks about the dominance of Israel over her enemies. There's the restoration of God's honor. There's the restoration of God's people. Um, and then um, we get that brings us to chapter 38 and 39, which is what we're going to look at tonight. So let's just all review. Got any questions, comments, anything before we move into chapters 38 and 39? All righty. Chapters 38 and 39. What he envisions here is these odd named figures, Gog of Magog, Prince of Rosh, and uh, this enigmatic, odd, not really easy to identify character comes along with this massive army that just completely covers the nation of Israel and then it's as if God snaps his finger and suddenly the threat is gone. Not only is the threat gone, but Gog of Magog is just completely obliterated. So it comes in the form of, of a futuristic kind of battle. But the point is that, you know, if you look at the previous chapters, God has promised protection and salvation for his people. And uh, having returned them to their land, his, his point is God will always protect his people. Now, there's some interpretive issues that come up, and we'll talk about that as we go through. Uh, so chapter 38 is primarily the defeat of them, and then chapter 39 is primarily the, the idea of their disposal, what God plans to do with them after they are defeated. I want you to notice a few things. In the opening verses of chapter 38, let me just read the first six verses. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man... Set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them splendidly attired, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them wielding swords, Persia, Ethiopia, and Put with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer with all its troops, Beth Togarma from the remote parts of the north with all its troops, many peoples with you. So it envisions this enigmatic character, Gog of the land of Magog. But if you look at it, there's seven nations. And anytime you see a cluster of seven somethings, it suggests that we're dealing with some figurative language. It, it, it suggests that we're dealing with, with metaphor. And it's interesting, if you go back to chapter 25, 25 through 32, there were seven nations there, and here there are seven nations. Now there's some differences in chapters 25 through 32, Ammon, Moab, Edom, Philistia, Tyre, Sidon, and Egypt. Those are nations that had been around for a long time, and most of them had been problematic for Israel for a long time. Now, he doesn't mention Babylon, but Babylon is the nation that made it possible for these others recently to be a problem for Israel. So you've got Babylon plus seven nations. And I think you've got the same kind of thing here in chapter uh, 38 and 39. You've got Gog of Magog, is how it's worded, along with seven other nations. So I think there's a parallel structure here. In chapters 25 through 32, Seven nations allied with Babylon uh, who had been their past long-standing enemies, but now he shifts to a future point of view. There is Gog of Magog, Gog of the land of Magog, with seven other nations. These are far more obscure. They're more remote. They are less familiar to the uh, is Israelites. And this is some kind of futuristic something. So there's two clusters of seven nations, and I think each one serves a particular purpose. I think the parallel that he's doing here, he's saying that in the same way he had dealt with these seven nations, in the future he will deal with these seven nations. Uh, I think that's kind of why there's two clusters of seven nations that he's doing. He's make, basically making the same point about both of them, 
uh, but uh, he, he's doing it in a little bit different way. Yeah, uh, Richard? Yes. Gog is a person. Gog is who he is prophesying against. Yes, I believe it is. I'm going to get to that in a moment. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> Same question he had, basically. All right, but just I just wanted to show you something about the structure. I think this is significant that you've got two clusters of seven nations associated with another nation that's powerful. Okay, that, That's all I wanted you to see. But again, I think he's making a point here by doing this. In the same way that these long-standing, old, past enemies of, of Israel have been defeated by God, in the future, any enemies that come along, and I think these are just seven representative. Again, the number seven, I think, has significance here. It just means a, a complete list, if you will. Uh, in the same way, any of these future uh, enemies are going to be taken care of as well. Now, so that's the seven and seven. So who, where, all that. Gog. As best we can tell, this is probably a reference to the king of Lydia who lived about 700, about 700 years before the time of Christ. Uh, it, it was in the 600s that... that uh, this king of Lydia, his name was Gyges, and they think it was a dynastic name. In the same way like Pharaoh was, Pharaoh wasn't a personal name, it was a dynastic name. Uh, Ben-Hadad in Syria, that was a dynasty, the name of, of the dynasty. Gyges, this is a variation on that. Gog is simply represents the, the dynasty of the king of Lydia. Lydia was right in the middle of what we call Turkey. I say in the middle is probably more in the western part of Turkey. It was an ancient Anatolian kingdom. Okay, so he's. I, I think all of these actually have a basis in in uh, ancient places. These are real places. These are not made up names. So Gog is a reference to uh, the king of Lydia, an Anatolian kingdom. Uh, Magog is simply the territory in which Gog ruled. So there is Gog, there is Magog, the territory of Lydia in western Anatolia. Rosh is simply a prince, and I think it's, it's just a reference. It's not a place. Now, how the New American Standard uh, renders it, I forgot to start my Facebook thing. The masses are waiting. So uh, uh, how the New American Standard renders it in Ezekiel 38, verse... Uh, to Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of, and it looks like three places, Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I think Rosh is just a word for prince. I think he is, he is, it's a reference back to Gog. Gog of the land of Gagog, the prince. And then he includes Meshach and Tubal and prophesy against him. And uh, so I, I think Rosh is, is simply a, a, uh, a title. So it, yeah. Oh, yeah, I think they're all tied because if you look at this, most of these places are in Turkey. So I think they were all related. And, and in Genesis 10, it's a list of where uh, Japheth's descendants wound up. And, and they all wound up in very similar places, uh, which is really what you would expect. Uh, they, they probably swelled out in ancient Anatolia and, and these became separate nations. Yeah. How does the ESV read? How does the ESV read? Yeah. It's what I just said. Rosh is not a name or a place, it's a title. It's Prince. Yes. It's, it's, how you, it's just a different way of translating it. 
Some translate it as a place name, some translate it as a title. Yeah, in this in this particular case, uh, he his headquarters is in Lydia, but he has influence over these other places, uh, Meshach and Tubal. Meshach was another old kingdom in Anatolia. Tubal was another old kingdom in Anatolia, which was east of Meshach. If you were, I tried to find a map, and I couldn't find any that that weren't uh, basically dispensationalist maps. Uh, but basically, if you were looking at at Turkey. Uh, on the west, you, you've got uh, Magog. In the middle, you've got um, Meshach. And then east of there, you've got Tubal. So basically just three kingdoms that stretched across the interior of what we now call Turkey. Okay. Yes. Well, uh, that's what the ESV says, or uh, New American Standard footnote. Yeah. I, I I didn't. I, I can't understand what you're saying. Aquila. Okay. That I'm not sure about. Um, I'll take your word for it. Um, but what, folks, what we're seeing here is different ways to translate the Hebrew text. That, that's all it is. Anytime. And what I suggest to people is read different versions. Read the New American Standard, read the NIV, read the ESV. And, what, and when you see differences like that, what you're seeing is different ways to translate the same thing. Uh, a lot of times we think that translating a text is, is just, well, here's this word, here's this word. You can translate a text a dozen different ways. Uh, and, and different versions have different translational philosophies. I think this is my opinion. In my opinion, Rosh is simply a word that means prince. Gog of the land of Magog, he's the ruler of the land of Magog, and he is the prince over these surrounding territories. I think that's the best way to understand it. Okay? Moving on. Um, okay, then after that, later in the text, he mentions paras, is, is the literal Hebrew word. It's probably Persia. Uh, and then he mentions Cush or Ethiopia. He mentions Put, which is probably Pathros, which was a city in the upper part of, of Egypt. And then later he mentions Gomer. Gomer was a place that was north of the Black Sea. Uh, probably in modern times it would, it would equate to uh, probably part of Russia. And then Beth Togarma, which was eastern Anatolia, way east in, in Anatolia. Most of these are centered in Turkey. Now, the significance of this, I think, is this. He goes, for, again, you go back to chapter 25, seven nations. They were all old, familiar enemies. They had been around for centuries and centuries. Here, these are places that are, they're very old kingdoms, but Israel hadn't had much of anything to do with them. Uh, Israel really didn't know much about these. Uh, in the, at this point, Persia was really a very small place and had very little influence. Now, in a few years, they will become huge. The only really familiar ones here would be Cush and uh, possibly Put. Beyond that, these are unfamiliar places. Also, there's kind of an extremity in how these uh, are grouped. You've got Ethiopia and Pathros, which are way in the south. And then you've got some in the middle, and then you've got some way in the north. It's basically describing an expanse of nations from the extreme south to the extreme north. Basically, every place they could conceive of, you've got nations coalescing against Israel at some distant time in the future. Okay? Don't get hung up on the geography. Basically, these are old kingdoms. Most of them are located in Turkey, uh, and they're unfamiliar. This is Again, this is a futuristic thing. They are very unfamiliar to the Israelites. And yet at some point in the future, these mysterious, enigmatic nations come together to bring an assault against God's people. Now, chapter 38 is the defeat of Gog. First of all, in verses 1 through 9, he's, God summons uh, 
uh, Gog of Magog. Where have we seen something like that before? The idea that God summons a foreign nation, really? Yeah, he did it with Babylon. He did it with the Assyrians. Uh, in Isaiah, Isaiah refers to Cyrus, my servant, uh, 150 years before he was born. Uh, so God used foreign nations to accomplish his purposes. That, there's nothing new about that. This is just different. It's enigmatic. It's way in the future. Uh, so he conscripts these nations. Look in verse 8. When is this going to happen? In the latter years, and in verse 16, in the last days. Uh, in biblical prophecy, now some interpret that as at the end of time, but if you go to the New Testament, the concept of the last days or the latter times is the New Testament era, the Messianic era. And I think that's the, the best interpretation of it. But God summons them, he conscripts them to bring all of these troops together, all of these nations come together together, and if you'll notice, they're going to come to the land that is restored from the sword, verse 8, whose inhabitants have been gathered from the many nations to the mountain of Israel. So uh, they come to Israel post-exile, okay? And not just post-exile, but Israel now is living in peace. And then in verses 10 through 13, here's their motives. This is what Magog or Gog and Magog are thinking. It will come about on that day, verse 10, thoughts will come into your mind and you will devise an evil plan and you'll say, I'll go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go against those who are at rest that live securely, all of them living without walls and having no bars or gates. Now I want to stop there. What's the significance of a city not having bars or gates? They don't have them because they feel safe. So this is projecting into an entirely different era for Israel. When was Israel ever to, able to live in their land without bars and gates? <laughs> Never. But this is projecting a totally different time. I think it's talking about the Messianic era when they could, they could live in peace without worrying about external assault. And they come, verse 12, to capture spoil, to seize plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places which are now inhabited, against the people who are gathered from the nations who have acquired cattle and goods and, and live at the center of the world. And uh, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all its villages will say to you, have you come to capture spoil? So in verses 10 through 13, Gog of Magog thinks, well, we're going to walk in this place and just take everything. So that's the motives of what's going on. Verses 14 through 16 describe the advance of them. They come in from the far north, the remote parts of the north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great assembly, mighty army. You'll come up against my people, Israel, like a cloud. By the way, he used that same phrase back in verse 9 when he summons this army together. They basically cover Israel like a cloud. It shall come about in the last days that I will bring you against my land so that nations may know me when I am sanctified through you before their eyes, O Gog. Now, verse 16, you might want to think, okay, God's going to use Gog to do something to his people. Huh? -uh. How is God going to be sanctified through Gog? Going to utterly, totally defeat them and destroy them. I'm going to summon this great army, but there's not going to be a war. There's going to be a destruction of the army that invaded. And so then starting in verse 17, this is the judgment. Are you the one of whom I spoke in the former days through my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied in these days for many years that I would bring you against them? It will come about on that day when God comes against the land of Israel that my fury will mount up in my anger. In my zeal and in my blazing wrath, I will declare that, that on that day there will surely be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. The fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the fields, the creeping things that creep on the earth, and all the men who are on the face of the earth will shake at my presence. The mountains will also be thrown down. The steep pathways will collapse, and every wall will fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against him, and that's, Go back to the beginning of chapter 38. Who was him? Gog. 
Gog brings this army. He's ready to swallow up the land of Israel. And God says, no, when he gets here, I will take care of him. Yes. Yes. Well, up to this point, just about every time he has said, then they will know that I am the Lord, he's usually talking about judgments against Jerusalem or Israel. I'm going to judge them, and everybody will know because of my judgments. He also said the same thing in chapters 25 through 32 when he passed judgment against the nations. Uh, when he judges these nations, everyone will know that I'm the Lord. Now... It's shifted. It's, it's away from judgments against Israel. It's going to be judgments against these other powers. Any future threat that comes along, God would take care of them, and they will know that I am the Lord. Um, and so um, uh, every man's sword will be against his, um, against his brother with pestilence, blood. I will enter into judgment with him. Uh, I will rain on him, on his troops, on the many peoples who are with him, a torrential rain with hailstones, fire, and brimstone. I will magnify myself, sanctify myself, make myself known in the sight of many nations, and they will know that I am the Lord. So all of this is done ultimately for God's sake. Ultimately, the Lord does this for his reputation. Uh, this is not just to vindicate his people, this is to vindicate God uh, and his reputation, okay? All right, so that's basically chapter 38. Got any comments or questions? Okay, so God summons this obscure figure who's going to bring this massive army with the intent of destroying God's people. And he gets there and God says, huh, that's not why I brought you here. I brought you here to make an example of you. All right? Comments or questions? Now, chapter 39 begins in much the same way. Chapter 39 kind of picks up where chapter 38 left off. All of this goes back to Gog and what God plans to do with this figure. So in the first eight verses, it sounds a lot like kind of the, the second part of chapter 38. And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I'm against you, Gog, prince of Meshach and Tubal. And I will turn you around, drive you on, take you up from the remotest parts of the north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. I will strike your bow from your left hand and dash down your arrows from your right hand. You will fall on the mountains of Israel. Now, I want you to pause right there. Often the idea of falling on something signifies what? It's, it may signify death. The idea of falling, uh, if God falls on a people, he destroys them. Uh, here, uh, Gog falls on the mountains of Israel, not in the sense that they destroy Israel, but in the sense that they are destroyed on the mountains of Israel. And uh, I will strike your bow from your left hand, dash down your arrows from your right hand. You'll fall on the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and the peoples who are with you. I will give you as food to every kind of predatory bird and beast of the field. You will fall on the open field, for it is I who have spoken, declares the Lord God. And I will send fire upon Magog and those who inhabit the coastlands in safety, and they will know that I am the Lord. And it's not just that he destroys them in the land, but that last thing in verse 6, he goes back to where they're from and destroys them as well. Okay, so this is complete and utter annihilation. In verses 7, 8, and 9, My holy name I will make known in the midst of my people Israel. I will not let my holy name be profaned anymore. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. It is coming, it shall be done. That is the day of which I have spoken. So he starts out with just kind of repeats what he said. He adds to it the idea that they will become food for the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Uh, they will rot in open places, and they will become um, animal food. All right, then verses 9 and 10, not only that, but the Israelites plunder them, whereas Israel has been plundered before. 
uh, they, will be, they will do the plundering this time. Then those who inhabit the cities of Israel will go out and make fires with the weapons and burn them, both shields and bucklers, bows and arrows, war clubs and spears. And for seven years they will make fires of them. Now I want you to think about that imagery. They take all the, the um, armament of Gog and his massive army and the idea that they burned them for seven years, what does that suggest? There's a whole heap of them. They had so many weapons. And by the way, this implies what were their weapons made of. Their, their weapons are made... So they bring wooden shields. They bring wooden spears. They bring bows and arrows. They bring these wooden uh, weapons. And there's another... And, and doesn't that give you an indication of the size of Gog and Magog's army? It's got to be huge. And there's enough wood. And think about this too. In, in ancient Israel, wood was actually pretty scarce. Most of the trees that grew in Israel just looked like scrub brush. I mean, just they weren't very big at all. So wood was a fairly rare thing. There's enough wood here to burn for seven years, okay? So uh, there's enough wood here for seven years. They'll make fires with the weapons. Uh, they will take the spoil of those who despoiled them and seize the plunder of those who plundered them, declares the Lord God. So the despoiling of Gog. They went in, they plundered all of these nations, they bring this to Israel, they're going to destroy Israel, and he goes, uh, no, I'm going to destroy you and you're going to lose everything. Then verses 11 through 16, not only is that, not only are they going to be destroyed and plundered, they're going to be buried, okay? On that day, I will give Gog a burial ground there in Israel, the valley of those who pass by east of the sea, and it will block off those who would pass by. So they will bury Gog there with all his horde, and they will call it the Valley of Hamon Gog. Now that word Hamon, and then he, he repeats it down in verse uh, 16, Hamonah, which is plural. Hamon means a multitude, and Hamonah is multitudes, plural. Okay, So the multitude of Gog, and, and notice he said earlier, all of his horde. So this massive army, where do they wind up being buried? Basically in Israel, some valley we, we don't really know about. How long will it take to bury them? Seven months it takes to bury them, he says in verse 12. So another recurrence of the number seven. Uh, they bury them in order to cleanse the land. Even all the people of the land will bury them. It will be to their renown on the day that I glorify myself, declares the Lord God. They will set apart men who will constantly pass through the land, burying those who are passing through, even those left on the surface of the ground in order to cleanse it. And at the end of seven months, they will make a surge. There are so many corpses, they have guys going through the land looking for corpses to make sure they didn't miss anybody. Now, can you imagine what it would take to bury this size army? Um, and uh, as those who pass through the land, verse 15 uh, and anyone sees a man's bone, then he will set up a marker by it until the barriers have buried it in the valley of Hamon Gog, and the name of the city will be Ham Hamonah, so they will cleanse the land. It's interesting that in verse 15 he refers to it as a valley. In the next verse he refers to it as a city. Okay? Uh, the burial ground becomes a city. All right. Then in verses 17 through 20, uh, there is the devouring of Gog. Now, he hinted at that earlier when the uh, birds of the air, the beasts of the field, start to eat the, the corpses of them. And he really kind of turns up that imagery in verses 17 through, 19, or 17 through 20. As for you, son of man, thus says the Lord, speak to every kind of bird and to every beast of the field. Now, think about that. Now, he's got the prophet prophesying or instructing the animals to, to come do their job. Assemble and come and gather from every side to my sacrifice, which I'm going to sacrifice for you as a great sacrifice on the mountains of Israel that you may eat flesh and drink blood. You will eat the flesh of mighty men, drink the blood of the princes of the earth as though they were rams, lambs, goats, bulls, all of them fatlings of Bashan. You will eat uh, fat of them until you are, until you are glutted You'll drink blood until you are drunk from my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you. You'll be glutted at my table with horses and charioteers, with mighty men and all the men of war. They are feasting on the remains of the army that they defeated. Pretty graphic stuff. Okay? 
But again, it's total defeat. I mean, you think about this, Gog of Magog, Gog of the land of Magog brings this massive, massive army. And they get to the land of Israel. Their intent is just to cover it, completely annihilate it. And God says, no, I got other plans. I'm going to destroy you. And, and now they have become a feast for, for uh, the people. Earlier they're a feast for the birds and the beasts. Now they're a feast for the people themselves. And then uh, the conclusion of it, uh, this is the Lord's summary. I will set my glory among the nations, starting verse 21. All the nations will see my judgment, which I have executed in my hand, uh, which I have laid on them. The house of Israel will know that I am the Lord their God from that day onward. The nations will know that the house of Israel went into exile for their iniquity. So basically Israel's past. But look at ver verse 25, their future. Therefore thus says the Lord, now I will restore the fortunes of Jacob and have mercy on the whole house of Israel. I will be jealous for my holy name. They will forget their disgrace and all their treachery which they perpetrated against me when they live securely on their own land with no one to make them afraid. When I bring them back from the peoples and gather them from the lands of their enemies, then I will be sanctified through them in the sight of the many nations. So basically, God says this defeat will let everyone know I am serious about uh, restoring my honor and dignity. Okay, questions about the text. We'll talk about some interpretive issues here in a moment, but questions, yeah. They didn't do a thing. There is no indication here that, that they even lift a finger. They're dwelling securely in their cities without walls. This massive army comes up and God says, you're done. And the only thing that we're told about Israel is they get to get the spoil of Gog and they get, to, they get a feast. And they spend a lot of time burying corpses. But Israel does nothing. There's no actual battle here. And, and that suggests that we're dealing here with a lot of figurative ideas. Not a literal army, not a literal battle, but just... Again, the imagery that he uses suggests that this is something different, that he has something different in mind. Uh, yeah. Yeah, basically he turns this massive army against themselves. And there, there's, uh, uh, it, it, it's the Lord's, what it denotes is just the Lord's absolute sovereignty over any kind of human pride, any kind of human power. Uh, it, it's, it's the idea that uh, the Lord will just take care of this. He's got the resources to do it. And, and the idea of brother against brother, and this is one of the reasons why I connect it with the Messianic era Remember in uh, Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10, verse 21, brother will betray brother to death, a father against his child, children will rise up against parents, cause them to be put to death. Uh, the gospel itself would turn family members against family members. And I think that's something of what he's, he's talking about here. Let, let's move ahead a little bit before we run out of time. Okay, just look at the big picture. Number one, there is a shift from past familiar enemies to future unfamiliar imageries. And the enemies from the extremities of the north and south, he says they come from the north, but there are also some su southern em enemies. I started to say M&Ms. Uh, wow, I wonder what I was thinking. Um, it's an indefinite future time period. You know, this is not like Daniel who says this happens after so many weeks and and, and that kind of thing. This is just a future indefinite time, but it matches up with the kind of language we see elsewhere in the Old Testament prophecies. It's stuff we see in the New Testament. Uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, when the apostles preach to the crowd at, on the day of Pentecost, they quote from Joel, in the latter days, same, same uh, phraseology here, my spirit will be poured out on mankind, and Peter says, you're looking at it. The latter days had come. And uh, also there's some language and imagery here that's kind of impossible to interpret literally. Now look at this. 
Repeated use of the number seven. I don't know if you picked up on this. Okay, so verses two, uh, let's see, hang on here. I think I've got a chart on this. Uh, repeated use of the number seven, the valley that becomes a city. And it, it's a judgment against a small place on the map, a judgment against Israel, and yet it involves the whole earth. So again, this, this is symbolic in nature. Sevens. Seven times in chapters 38 and 39, this exact phrase occurs. Thus says the Lord God. Seven times. There are seven nations. I showed you that at the beginning of the text in chapter 38, verses 2 through 6. There's a listing of seven judgments in chapter 38, verses 21 and 22. The sword, the pestilence, the blood, the rain, the hailstones, the fire, and brimstone. Seven judgments are brought against Gog of Magog. There are seven types of plunder when you get to chapter 39, verse 9. Weapons, shields, bucklers, bows, arrows, war clubs, spears. So seven different kinds of weapons, and they burn for seven years. Twice in, so twice in one verse, there's a double reference to the number seven. Takes seven months to bury the dead in chapter 39, verse 12. And then when you look at the feast, the Israelites feast on the, the remains of their enemy, seven items, the flesh of mighty men, the blood of the princes, rams, lambs, goats, bulls, uh, and, and fatlings. So seven items on the menu. So the repeated use of the number seven, I think the readers of Ezekiel would have heard that. Okay, this is symbolism here. Um. Also, some problems with kind of taking this uh, in, at, at, in literal face value. You've got long dead kingdoms, kingdoms that had not existed for centuries. Remember, Gog is a dynastic name that dated to seven centuries before the time of Christ, and yet he's projecting into the future. And most of these uh, allies uh, earlier, uh, even the ones like with the references to Egypt, remember what... Um, uh, uh, Ezekiel said earlier, Ezekiel's, or Egypt's going to be totally wiped out. Uh, they're going to lose their significance as a nation. They would never have the dominance that they would ever have again. So long dead kingdoms suddenly get revised. So I think it suggests that we're dealing here with, with figurative ideas, figurative language. The use of horses in modern warfare. Um, I remember, it probably doesn't take, uh, some of you probably remember this, but remember back in the, uh, like particularly in the 70s, every dispensationalist on the planet was predicting that, that Russia was the fulfillment of Gog and Magog and they're going to bring their, their nuclear weapons. If you take this literally, you can't do that. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, remember, um, oh, uh, uh, what was the guy's name? Hal Lindsey, yeah, Hal Lindsey's, uh, late great planet Earth and all those. The thing is, he was saying that Russia and their nuclear weapons and their massive army is the fulfillment of that. Huh, in this text, they're riding horses, they're not riding tanks. Yeah, yeah, and, and so th the problem is, every place that's listed at the beginning of chapter 38 is rooted in history, not, that he uses them in a futuristic way but, but to apply it literally breaks down. The, the idea of, of trying to find fulfillment in nuclear weapon or biological warfare, the problem is they use wooden weapons that burn for seven months. That doesn't work with a futuristic, literalistic application. The extreme number of corpses, you couldn't even fit them. There's not enough real estate in Israel to bury them, and yet that's exactly what happened. So... You've got some things that are anachronistic. They just don't add up. Uh, oh, well, that's it. <laughs> so anyway, uh, when you look at the prophecy, I think it, it best fits the idea that he's talking here, not about some future literal war, but about the messianic era when God protects his people, when God says, you're not going to destroy my people in the way that you once did. And that's particularly true if Israel, if God's people today do not constitute a physical nation, but a spiritual nation of, of people. So anyway, I think that's the best way to look at chapters 38 and 39. We'll pick up uh, there next time.
I'd like to welcome everyone to our services this evening. Uh, the only announcement that I want to bring to the attention that I'm aware of is uh, tomorrow night at uh, Panera Bread, the, the study with uh, Tim uh, on 64. Is there anything else we need to mention at this time? We led in our first song then. Two hundred and forty-eight. Christ arose. We'll sing the uh, first three verses, and then we'll have the chorus after the third verse. Three verses, and then the chorus only one time after the third verse. Low in the grave he lay. Jesus, my Savior, waiting the coming day. Jesus, my Lord, vainly they watch his bed. Jesus, my Savior, vainly they seal the dead. Jesus, my Lord, death cannot keep its prey. Jesus, my Savior, triumph for his foe. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saint to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Seven hundred twenty two, seven two two on Zion's glorious summit. No, so on Zion's glorious summit stood a numerous host redeemed by blood. They am the king and strange divine. I to join. I heard the song and strove to join. Hear all who suffered sword or flame, for truth or Jesus lovely name. Shout victory now and Roll eternal love shall feast their soul and sings of bliss forever new. Rise in succession to their view. Rise in succession to their view. Adored, who like 
me thy praise should sing, O Almighty King, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of hosts on high adored, Holy, Holy, Holy. Good evening. Tonight, uh, I want to talk a little bit about baptism. Uh, I want to look at it from a slightly different perspective, though, because we often talk about the importance of baptism, and it is very important. And I think the reason that we talk about it so much is because the rest of the world has decided it's not important. They don't uh, agree with what God's Word said. Um, but... Uh, it does help us. It's associated with our forgiveness of sins. Uh, it's associated with our salvation. It uh, is associated with us being added to the church. Um, it's associated with us entering Christ. And so it's very important and very necessary, and we often emphasize it. But I want to talk tonight about things that baptism will not do for you. Baptism does not change your heart. One man once said, I was baptized, it didn't do me any good. I was just as bad afterward as I was before. And that's because he was baptized thinking that that was going to somehow magically change him. But it did not because he has to change his heart first. It's associated with your faith with your repentance. It's, we have to obey from the heart. That's our intellect. Baptism does not remove sin, uh, temptation, I'm sorry, does not remove temptation. If you remember when Jesus was baptized, it was right after that that he was tempted by the devil. We too will be tempted once we become Christians. In James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, it says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. We will have trials when we become a Christian. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And then in verse 4 it says, And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And so baptism will not take away the temptation. In fact, we are, almost, we are guaranteed that we're going to be tried and tested as Christians. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as, as is common to man, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. In fact, and let's read Ephesians verses, uh, chapter 6, verse 11. We'll begin in verse, uh, verse 10. It says, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. If you think you were tempted before you became a Christian, the devil is going to be earnest about trying to tempt you once you become a Christian. He wants you to change again and go back to him. Baptism will not guarantee your eternal salvation. Though many in the world teach once saved, always saved, you will not find that in the Bible. 
after one becomes a Christian, according to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1, you can be caught in a trespass. And it tells the other Christians in that verse that ye who are spiritual restore such a one. In the spirit of gentleness, each one look into yourself so that you too will not be tempted. So you will be tempted and you can fall, you can sin, and you will need restoration. But thankfully, a way is provided for that to happen. We can repent and God says that he will take us back. In uh, let's read Second uh, Peter two verses twenty through twenty two. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world, by the knowledge of the Lord and Jesus Christ and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow, after washing, returns to wallowing in the mire. He's talking to Christians and saying, you can turn back. And it's like a dog returning to his vomit. And so... It does not guarantee your eternal salvation. But we can be obedient. We can ask for repentance. I mean, we can repent and ask for forgiveness. And God says that he will take us back. Baptism is not the end of obedience. It is the beginning. It's the beginning of a brand new life in Christ. And so, tonight, I just wanted to say a few things because most of us are Christians and we know that we have to believe, we have to repent, we have to confess, we have to be baptized, but it's just the beginning. We then have to be faithful until death. And so baptism will not automatically get you a seat in heaven. Baptism will get you into Christ. It will get you into the church. And then you have to be faithful until death. We have to be faithful until we receive what's called the crown of life in Revelations 2 and verse 10. Baptism is essential. It's very important. You cannot be saved without it. But just as faith alone cannot save you, baptism alone can not Maybe you aren't a Christian tonight and you want to be. Tonight's the time. The water's ready. If you believe, if you're willing to repent, if you're willing to confess Christ, then you can be baptized and you can be added to the church. and You can start your journey to heaven. If you need to repent because you haven't been faithful, then now's a good time to do that as well. We can serve your spiritual needs in any way right now. Please come while we stand and sing. All things are ready. All things are ready, come to the feast, come for the table now is spread. Ye famishing, ye weary, come, and thou shalt be richly fed. Hear the invitation, come who? So ever will praise God for full salvation for who so ever will all things are ready come to the feast 
Come, for the door is open wide. A place of honor is reserved for you at the Master's side. Hear the invitation, come who so salvation for whosoever will. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Leave every care and worldly strife. Come feast upon the love of God and drink everlasting life. Hear the invitation, come whosoever will. Praise God for full salvation, for whosoever Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for this opportunity to sing praises to you, to open your word, to study your word. Heavenly Father, be with us as we continue on life. May we always be that shining light that will bring someone to you. Heavenly Father, be with those who are sick. Reach out your hand, heal them if it's your will, and bring them back to us. Heavenly Father, as we continue on in our lives, may we always keep you in our hearts and our minds. For these things we give blessing and praise to your Son, 